play at FunkCon. Y'all have a good time. Uh, thanks to Marcus and Steve and all the other folks who are volunteering behind the scenes to make sure that uh, we can have this fun event. Um, I am uh, Dr. Eric Wesselman. I'm a professor of psychology at Illinois State University. One of my many, many interests is connecting psychology topics to popular culture, especially comics. I also teach a class called Psychology in the X-Men, which the show features very prominently in. Um, this is a great thrill for me to be able to do this, like many of you. I grew up watching the show, uh, hands down it was my favorite. I loved watching the characters, their joys, their sorrows, their struggles, and it ultimately made me feel le like okay to be different, right? And to, uh, um, to be really interested in issues of identity or belonging, and now that I'm a psychologist, I study those things. And it's probably safe to say that the X-Men the Animated Series had a huge impact on my career trajectory. But you didn't come here to listen to me. You came here to uh, listen to these fine folks here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each of the panelists, and uh, we'll get the conversation started. So uh, first to my left, we have Laura Zahn, actress of uh, stage and screen, politician, and advocate for social justice. For today's panel, she is known as the voice of Rogue. Lenore, what does X in the Animated Series mean to you? Mm, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I want to say hi, y'all. So nice to see you here and to meet all of you in person. You guys have been so nice and warm to all of us and made us feel very, very welcome. Um, it's great to get out after the pandemic and actually meet people face to face. Uh, you know, the X-Men, as you know, this is the 30th anniversary of our show. And when we first did the show, we had no idea where it was going from there. We, we had no idea the impact it would have on the world, really. Um, so when I first started playing Rogue, I just fell in love with my character. I loved the fact that she was a kick-ass woman who didn't take any guff from anybody, but she would stand up for the underdog and she couldn't stand injustice. And I could really relate to that. So fast forward now, 30 years later, I mean, in some ways, it's almost like days of future past. There's so much, um, antagonism and anger and hatred and vitriol in the world where some people are pitting themselves against others and trying to say some people aren't as worthy as they are because they have a different um, language or skin color or religion or whatever. Um, that I think the show has stood the test of time and it's time for it to come back. We need the X-Men because we stand for it, diversity and inclusion and oh, all of us belonging to the same family and wanting to belong. So I think that's what the X-Men means to me and I'm, I'm just really grateful to be here and share these thoughts with all of you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Next we have Allison Corp. Uh, actor and director. Much of Allison's work has been in children's entertainment, but relevant to today's panel, she is known as the voice of Jubilee. So, Allison, uh, what does X Men the Animated Series mean to you? Um, well, I think, you know, Lenore put it beautifully from that the full just, I guess, being part of something so much bigger than us uh, and the, the impact that it's had on so many people's lives around the world. From a personal standpoint, um, Playing Jubilee, uh, you know, I now work with actors who come in who are of Asian descent, and and they are all the, like, there's there will this, be this little private moment. They'll be like, I just want to say, I grew up watching X Men. It meant the world to me. And my initial response will be like, I'm so sorry that I voiced an Asian character, and I'm. You know, I'm white, and they're like, "What are you talking about?" It, that didn't matter. Having a character on screen mattered. Being represented mattered. So it's it's been just nothing but a, a huge honor to have been able to do that. Um, and I think not just for for racial diversity, but just for personality. You know, all of the differences that make being so wonderful. We in the room get that. There's a lot of people out there that for whatever reason they don't understand that diversity makes us stronger, makes us 
that much better. Um, but for those sitting at home, just having representation of some form on the screen means so much. So it's, yeah, it's been a huge obstacle. Awesome. All right, next we have Eric Leewald, uh, who's worked on a variety of uh, TV and film shows, uh, but for our purposes today, is the showrunner and head writer for X Men the Animated Series. Also, wrote one of two books uh, that you can conveniently get here to. But uh, uh, please, uh, Eric, tell me what does um, X Men the Animated Series mean to you? Well, uh, as somebody that grew up loving movies and TV, uh, which I got from my dad, my late father, um, it was the greatest opportunity in 35 years of doing it uh, that I ever had in, in writing screen stories. Because I really, I really love heroic stories, and stories of heroic sacrifice, and stories of characters that get to know each other and care enough about each other to band together and struggle for something and it was the perfect storm for that it was just wonderful um and as anybody can tell you that work tries to work in hollywood um eight out of ten things that you get to work on well you do your best and you hope for the best and it's just so collaborative a, a thing that you know, it ends up coming out. Oh, that was okay, and it paid my bills, and uh, my, fed my kids, and it's my day, it's my day job. But this one was magic, and uh, don't know why, but uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Our, our final panelist, but certainly not least, is Julia Lee Wald, who has also worked on quite a few movies and TV show properties. Uh, for the purposes of today's panel, she uh, was the lead writer for two of the uh, X-Men episodes and assisted on 74 other episodes. She also curates the official website and social media presence for X-Men the Animated Series and co-wrote with Eric the other book that I mentioned, which I see several copies out there as well. So. Uh, Julia, what does X Men the Animated Series mean to you? The fact that here we are, 30 years from the day it was released, which this is the 30th anniversary yeah. year of the, of the show's sneak peek on Halloween night. The fact that we're talking about it, that it mattered to anyone and that it mattered to people who still have it in their hearts is huge that I got to be a part of the family that made X Men the Animated Series and let folks also experience the idea of finding a, found family, finding a found family. Goodness knows, if you're here because you watched the show, you know that they all didn't get along all that well all the time, but they had enough in common that they found it in each other that the older I get, the more I appreciate what family is and can mean, and not everyone has that in their lives, and I like to think that in its way, X Men the Animated Series offered folks their version of a found family and continues to do so astonishingly 30 years later. I'm just proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Yes, I, I remember very fondly the, uh, the sneak peek on Halloween. As a 12 year old, I ran home early, cut out on getting candy to see that preview. So. Yeah. Something else. <laughs> So I've uh, written a couple questions here to ask uh, the panelists specifically, uh, so we'll kind of talk about those for a little bit and then transition to audience Q&A. Uh, but first, some specific questions. Um, we'll start with Eric. Um, what would you say the show's legacy has been on the uh, TV animation industry? Well, I, for one thing, it's, it's hard to imagine now, but when uh, Margaret Lesh, who pitched this and made this happen, was the president of Fox Kids when it was put on the air, it's, you know, she committed to this. She had been trying for 10 years to get this show on the air, and all of Hollywood just looked at her and said, eh, so, you know, kids won't watch superhero shows. You know, they want, and this is just a, a few pimply guys in their basements reading comic books. This, we don't have an audience for this. This is just not, not something that's going to work. 
And that showed the, the great wisdom of these people, the, the billion dollar companies. And Margaret just said, no, I thought, look at these stories. These are really human stories. And so she finally gets in a position to do it. And I think the legacy we got out of it was that we were able to tell serious human adults in like the most reverential way stories that affected children and touched children at the same time. And that was just, we just kept on being told, no, 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 before this and the jobs I had before this, you have to dumb it down, you know, if, if you make something a little too challenging, the kids are going to turn the channel because there's something else silly and fun. And you know, where's the humor in these stories? What, what kind of scripts are you writing? Lots of pushback on this show that seems absurd 30 years later after it became so successful. But I, th I think the legacy really is that, that you can do an animated show, you can do something that's just a cartoon, but you can put your heart and soul into it and it works. It gets the people, it, it means something to people that you put out the effort. I think, I, I don't think you're even giving it enough credit, and you guys enough credit. You wrote that show with a sophisticated tone. You didn't dumb it down, and you wrote it for adults as much as for kids, and it completely changed cartoons. It was the first, that's when people finally went, oh, it doesn't have to be for kids. You have that, you know, the, the amazing, um, the Batman series that was there, that came after, because you did it first with X-Men, and you fought all those demons, and then other shows were able to come afterwards and get the huge budgets, and you know, that, some of the shows just look unbelievable, right? Um, none of that would have happened without X-Men paving the way. Uh, and then you look at, look at the entire movie industry now, Everything is about, like, it's it's about superheroes. And it all started, it started with the X-Men movies. Yeah, they did, like, they had the fun Batman movies and stuff, but, like, that didn't change the movie industry. Um, and when, and it saved Marvel in many ways. Like, yeah. X-Men saved Marvel. They were struggling. And now look at how they, like, it, it owns Hollywood, like, in terms of, like, the, the impact that it's had on movies and film and television, and the fact that cartoons do not have to just be for children, or you can make something that children will watch, but it can it can be sophisticated for adults too. And if, when you have good writing and incredible characters and those incredible human stories that you're talking about, it doesn't matter what age you will watch because it's good. So you guys, I think you changed everything. Yeah. <laughs> Worked my mics, I would work. They were my mics, I would drop them. <laughs> but they're not. So, thank you. Um, uh, Julia, um, because you've interacted with fans so much, I, um, this fandom, this, this large, international, more so than any contemporary show at the time, and certainly more than even the subsequent X Men iterations, right? So. What do you think is you know the magic from what you hear from the fans? Um, why the, why this show? That's very interesting, and it kind of Eric and I have said this more than once that when we were, and with the voice talent too, when we were all doing our jobs, we had our heads down doing the job next, head down doing your job next, doing your best work. But we weren't in an environment, and the internet didn't exist, where we were getting any kind of feedback. One time, my my realization moment was I, I went to the Fox Kids studios. That was not a thing we did very often, but had to, had to go there for some business. And casually mentioned to Charlotte Fullerton, who herself an Emmy-nominated writer, who was working at the time at Fox Kids, I, I said, are you getting any kind of feedback on X-Men? You know, because I, I know the ratings are good, but do you, do you get any fan mail? And she said, uh -huh, come with me. And she walked me into a hallway and there were that, that sort of milky white carton full of mail that you see postmen carry around. There was one, and it was stacked to the ceiling. And it was stacked beside it all the way down the hall and all the way back up. Ceiling high, everyone full. And she goes, every one of those is a kid writing about X-Men. And I had never seen it physicalized before. I didn't know. 
And then here we are, 2017, thinking about the 25th anniversary coming up. I'm trying to learn how to use Twitter and just find people out there who had fond memories of the show. And making connection and realizing, my goodness, uh, it, it, there is a, a lot of people for whom it mattered. And being able to connect with them in a positive, nice way on Twitter, that's even more important. <laughs> Gotta say, Twitter can get scary. But the, the X-Men fan base that we've connected with genuinely love what the show is about and genuinely carry that with them. So I'm, I'm grateful for finding that. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm going to move to uh, our uh, voice cast a bit. Um, so Lenore, many of the characters in the X universe uh, are morally complex or have some aspect of tragedy about them. Rogue perhaps more than most. How did you approach the character to bring that, that pathos to life? Um, well, <clears throat> first of all, I want to, go before I go into that, piggyback on what Julia said about the fan mail that we got way back when we first did the show. Um, we never got that fan mail. The cast that the fan mail was written to, we had no idea it even existed. We, we did not know that the show was successful. We didn't know that we had huge fan following all around the world. Nobody ever told us. So we never found out really how big it was until a few years ago when some of us started going on these Comic-Con uh, tours. And we met like in Los Angeles, for instance, like 100,000 fans and people were starting to tell us what the, it, the show meant to their lives and crying, you know, and telling us how it made them feel like they belonged finally. They would race home from school and they might be bullied at school or maybe they have some mental health issues or they part of the LGBTQ uh, community but they hadn't come out yet. And we made them feel it's okay to be different. So. I gotta say, you know, it, it's mind blowing and it's overwhelming and it's really humbling to see the effect that it has had all these years and to find out about it now, like 30 years later. Um, and I'm sorry to any kids who wrote to us and who didn't hear back. Because <laughs> that's the reason. We, didn't, we had no idea. Um, but yeah, to play a tragic hero, I, I started off doing theater and I love Shakespeare. I love all the great classic playwrights. And so you learn in when you're studying theater and drama that you know every great classic uh, character and mythology too, in myth I love, I've always loved mythology, that every great hero also has what we call an Achilles heel. They have a vulnerability, which sometimes their strength is their vulnerability, is their, is their Achilles heel. So every mythological hero has this one sort of weakness or vulnerability. And so I was able to tap into that, um, that idea and that perspective with Rogue because I quickly realized she is the strongest woman in the universe. She can pick up buildings and throw them. Once she unfortunately kills Ms. Marvel or puts her into the coma, she takes on her ability to fly. But she can never be intimate with anybody because she learned when she was 13. You know, I, I remember when I was 13, I kissed me. I had me a boyfriend, had me a boyfriend until I kissed him. Poor boy went into a coma for three days. It got so if I touched anybody, it just drove the life right out of him, right? So to have that happen when you're 13, that you, the, the boy that you were in love with, you almost kill him by kissing him, that's pretty traumatic, right? So she learned that she cannot be intimate with anybody, so she can never be skin to skin with anyone. So, so her strength is also her Achilles heel. It's her vulnerability. And so that is a really neat way of looking at Rogue. And I'll let, I'll let that sit with y'all for a little bit. And, and then when you watch her again and you see some of the episodes or the new season, keep that in mind. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So for a bit more character insight, uh, Allison, um, narratively, uh, the character of Jubilee was the identification point for the audience members, either because of age similarity or just 
lack of knowledge of the expansive universe that we were all entering into. Um, so how did you approach Jubilee's um, uh, character to sort of encourage maximum connection with the audience? Um, I, I capitalized on my ignorance. <laughs> I uh, I didn't know the X Men. I, I had no knowledge of the world or the character, um, which probably helped. I think because you know, Night of the Sentinels Part One and Part Two. It is about Jubilee not understanding at all what's happening to her or the world that she's suddenly finding herself in. So it um, you know I very much was parallel Jubilee in, in the series. She and I kind of learned about the X-Men together. Um, so I think it was, for me, I I just, I approached her like, if it was me, what's, like, what the hell is happening, you know, and then and being judged for being different. And as a teenager at the time, it was like, it was pretty relatable. So I didn't have to do a whole lot of homework. It kind of, it was right there. It was, I was living it. Thank you. So I'm going to take a break from the question, other questions that I have and, and turn it to, to the audience and see if we have any audience questions. If not, I can continue talking. <laughs> <laughs> but please, uh, if, you, if you've got a question, raise your hand and I'll see if the microphone can stretch out to you. Or maybe you want to be partially. There's one over here. Huh? Is there one in the middle? Yes. Oh, well, so Toby, we'll do first. Actually, why don't you go up uh, or shout it out? We'll just do it now, <laughs> and then we'll come to you next. So. Do you think it's possible that Rogue could have had a relationship with the mutant Leech? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the funniest questions. <laughs> <laughs> Just become circular. They keep uh, yeah. inhabiting each other, and then he just spins into well, a tornado. His, uh, powers they neutralize other mutants' powers, don't they? I, well, yeah, he, he just I thought he, he like leeched, leeched the life out. I don't know if he actually gets rid of their power, like their mutant power. My understanding was he just kind of leeched the life out of them, kind of knocked them out. But you could be right. I it, it's embarrassing to admit that fans tend to know more than. The that ran the show <laughs> about, about, about some of the finer details of some of the secondary characters. You know, we, we learned all we could as fast as we could, but uh, we, there's some blind spots here for sure. And to be honest, I really don't know much about Leech. Well, to, to his point, I, I don't know that, that character really. But we know about Gambit. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hi. I got a question about Rogue. Okay. Wow. Uh, I'm doing. Oh, uh, will she finally have a happy ending, you know, finally control her power or lose her power? And finally, like, her and Gamic will have, like, a family, kids together. That's what I'm wondering. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say it. We signed a non disclosure agreement, and we're not allowed to tell you what happens in X Men 97. Or beyond. You don't tell anyone. Turn your cameras. Yeah. Well, when our set. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. If we, we, I don't. We've already been a little too loose lipped. Uh, a couple of months ago, I got got a note saying, you know, what, watch what you say. I mean, they want to, They want this all to be a wonderful, glorious surprise for you next year and when it comes out. And what we can say about it is that. It's not a new a reimagining of the X-Men. It's not a different look for the X-Men. It is absolutely, definitely a continuation of our show. And it's the same, it's, it's going with the idea that it's a short time later and you're follow, following the stories and lives of basically these same people doing the same things and there'll be references back to what happened before in our show. So it's not, it's, to us, it's the, like the best po of all possible worlds. You know, they could have had a separate universe. They could have had different X Men. There'd been, I remember when I looked to, to do this show, there had been 29 people that had been X Men between 1963 and 1992. So they, there could have been a whole completely different team if they wanted to, and they still would have been legitimate X Men. But it is absolutely a straight continuation of our show with. Beautiful animation and wonderful budgets and, 
a huge crew of very, very talented young people making the show. And I'd like to add, you could always write to Marvel and Disney and say, we want another show of, of Rogue and Gambit. <laughs> 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 Get, get all your social media people together yeah. and make it a flood, right. and then we'll all get more work. So. <laughs> Hashtag spin off, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Any other? Uh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, Jeff. Uh, was it surreal to see Patrick Stewart roll out <laughs> in that iconic yellow? You know, wheelchair with the theme song yeah. in the movie. Oh, we're, we're talking uh, Doctor Strange into yeah, the Multiverse yeah, of Madness, yeah, right? Yeah. And you Has everyone it. seen that yet? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Or you seen the trailer? And just to give you an idea how careful they're being, you know, Larry Houston did their artwork for our show, and we and a couple other people, you know, the, the hour that that trailer came out, we said, wait a minute, that's. Xavier in the Doctor in the, in the Doctor Strange movie trailer. What's going on here? And we got a note real quickly saying, "Now look, all you people that are saying this is Xavier, we haven't claimed that." Yet. And you know, okay, fine, it's Patrick Stewart's voice. We don't think we got. But they are being very careful what they want to tell you about the new show. But it's just to let you know they are they are doing the very most spectacular one they can. And you know, we just we shake our heads at the. At the budgets and schedules they've got, we all have, we all have new, new show envy. <laughs> Those of us on the production side of the old show. But that was pretty cool. Come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, we all knew it was. Yeah. They knew it was. Oh, and I want to do a quick shout. Oh, speaking of the music, I yeah. want to do a quick shout out. Uh, the, the fellow who deserves all the credit for the theme to X Men the animated series is a fellow named Ron Wasserman who was under contract at the time and received his weekly salary, but he didn't get any bonus for creating the X-Men theme song. He doesn't get any residuals. And he also created the Power Rangers theme song. So that guy's two for two. Oh. And doesn't yeah. get any residuals. Yeah. So, and, and he got, you know, a week's pay to, to create those two things. So, <laughs> so I, I like to say his name when I can, just so he gets credit for something that we all have in our heads. <laughs> Here's more of just a fun question. We're actually the I know everybody doesn't know the exact abilities of Jubilee, but everybody loves Batman. And I've even thrown that up thrown that out to my friends. Even Jubilee could kick Batman's ass. So what, what does everybody think? Well, of Batman? Chili fries. <laughs> <laughs> I think while we're here in Denver, we should go for chili fries <laughs> and do a TikTok. <laughs> Make that happen. Yeah. 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 First, it's been great to meet all of you and that you came out for the con. Um, it has questions for you folks. When it came to the casting for the series, were you approached for your roles? Did you find that you were interested in doing voicing for an animated series? How did you get? How did you find yourselves in the role of Rogue and Jubilee? Okay. Um, I hadn't really done much animation before when I got cast for Rogue. I had played a lot of American characters in American and Canadian movies. Um, and I had played a number of Southerners. So I'd done, been doing the Southern accent in my movie roles. And so when the call came out that they were looking for a woman uh, who could do a, who had a low, husky, sultry, sexy kind of voice who, with a southern accent. My agent at the time in Toronto went, oh my god, that's Lenore. And she tried to get me to go to the first auditions, but I wasn't that interested in animation at the time. I was doing movies and television and theater and all kinds of stuff. And so I didn't go to those auditions. But then they had callbacks a few months later, and um, my agent called me again and said, Lenore, they're still looking for the right actress for this role, and I know they haven't found her because it's you. So she said, get your ass in gear and go over and do the audition. And I was like, okay, all right, I'll go in for the callbacks. And then once I went in the booth and I just started talking, I think my first line was, my dad liked to kill himself when he found out I was a mutant. Um, <laughs> they all kind of went, ah, that's her, don't let her leave the building. 
And and that's the story. That's how I got the the character. That's it. <laughs> um, I was not cast initially. I went to the first audition, but um, Fox Kids had also done Beetlejuice, and Larry. Uh, uh, was Larry? Was Larry? On it? Or, or, Did Larry work on? No, uh, he wouldn't have with the uh, yeah, but, okay. but, but, yeah. but the, the Fox but executive said that I wanted to Eric supervise did, it. And, but yeah, so and I Eric and some of the guys had been on, on um, Beetle Juice. Beetlejuice. But the main guy at the helm who worked under Margaret Lesh, Sidney Eyewander, uh, he basically had to listen to my voice as Lydia day in and day out as he was like approving episodes. And he made it very clear. He said to everybody, I don't care who you hire at this point for Jubilee, just do not hire Alice and Gold. I, I don't want to listen to her voice again. So I went in for the first audition, never heard anything. I get a call, I'm really, really sick. I went to Mexico, ate the guacamole, came back with hepatitis A. So I was very sick. And I get a call from my agent, she's like, so how sick are you? <laughs> I'm jaundiced. My like the whites of my eyes are yellow. I can't walk up the stairs without like having to sit down for breath. And she's like, "Okay, so you can still voice work, right?" <laughs> <laughs> so they need to, they, they're recasting. Do you remember this thing that you watched? I'm like, no. And she she said, "Yeah, can you go tomorrow at, for a recording? Um, they want you to." to voice the character of Jubilee. I, I don't know, I'll get, I'll get the details. Like, she couldn't even remember the name of the character. So, basically, for that first recording, that week, the rules were, like, I couldn't actually, I was rogue for my, I was basically rogue for the first week because I couldn't come in contact with people. Because my body was contagious. And it was like, I couldn't touch people, we could hug, like, anything that I touched had to be, like, incinerated or something like that. Um, <laughs> And uh, for the first, I would say, half the season, Sydney, Sydney was there at the recordings, and every time I opened my mouth, he would say, no, sounds like Lydia, do it again. <laughs> no, sounds like Lydia, do it again. I actually owe so much to Sydney because he forced me to figure out how to change my voice. Because I had really just, I kind of stayed in the Lydia part for Beetlejuice, we have to get to the neither world. Like it was very kind of nasally and, and just up here. And he, he forced me to find a different way of approaching and attacking the words, still sounding like a teenager, but not sounding like the same character and same voice. So he actually did me a favor by being such a hard ass on me. Um, but yeah, I got the part because, um, and I only found out from Julian and Eric the other night that um, the first recording was did not go well, and and that's why so many of us were recast. Yeah, we're, yeah. If I, if I could, yeah, so from the from the Los Angeles side of this, because these people were all working very hard in Toronto, Canada, three thousand miles away, however many thousand. Um, we had we we've been working on the show for a couple months, and we had like the first thirteen stories kind of laid out, and the first six or seven written, and we had decided, you know, with the blessing of the people above us, we're going to make this show so different from the cart, the sweet, cartoony, bouncy, kitty, kitty-ish shows that have come before, that, and, and we were excited to write it that way, with, oh my god, this is like writing, you know, uh, uh, an hour drama for, for prime time, we're really caring about these adult characters. So that's all in our heads, and that's all in the words, but poor guy that's in Toronto trying to direct these folks, Dan Hennessy, is getting these scripts and his, you know, the, 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 the business's previous 30 years of experience had been, uh, the networks want funny little kid, you know, voices, they want to be new. And so his first pass, he and Kevin Moore, uh, they cast, they did a first casting and they did a first recording of the script and we were waiting here in, in LA and we got the tape and it was like, oh my god, this is Scooby-Doo X-Men. <laughs> and we just all kind of curled up in a fetal position like, it's the end of the show, it's dead, it's never going to work, this isn't what we in our heads at all, what are we going to do? 
So Mark and that wasn't us, by the way. That was, was a different. That task. was a different group. Yeah, it, was, it was a different group of people. And again, it's not Dan's fault. He was doing what he'd done many times for them. He won, in, you know, the Beatles used to won an Emmy using more cartoony voices. So it wasn't bad. It just was wasn't what was in our head. So Sydney and Larry Houston and a couple guys from Marvel, Bob Harris and Jeff Hallmari, went up to Toronto to, to, to sit with Dan and say. We know what we're hearing. It's this much more adult thing, and this much more dramatic thing. Can you please recast basically the whole cast with the most dramatic, gravitas filled, you know, Shakespearean theater people that you got here at Toronto? They have a huge, you know, dramatic uh, uh, theater, theater people there. So it kind of pedaled and swung the other way. And we get people like Beast and Professor X and, and Magneto who had, and, and Apocalypse who had voices that could fill the Colosseum with their, <laughs> with their serious depth and gravity. And they worked at it, worked at it, worked at it, and it ended up being a unique sounding show. And I think it was, it was mostly because we had this reaction to the first thing, like, oh my god, that's so wrong. And so that's, but then they, they heard, they heard uh, Rogue, and boom, she's cat. They worked at it for a few weeks. To, to hear it from them, it took a while to find the voice. And they, they tried people and tried people, you're probably the 30th person and tried for Rogue. Well, like and, you said, I didn't go in until they right. very callbacks. Yeah, and they just, what, they weren't hearing it, they weren't hearing it, and then they heard her voice for five seconds, and that's it. And they did the same thing, Wolverine, same thing, Sydney says in his interview in our book, he said, well, uh, this guy, Cal Dodd, who never done a show before, done jingles and he was a singer. And Come, television. And, and, and television. And theater. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but certainly had done the voice of the show. Yeah, and And Cal said, yeah, well, who's this Wolverine guy? And mm -hmm. Sydney just says, well, he's kind of feral. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Cal just looks around and, and he grabs and said, and everybody in the booth, in the recording booth, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I, and it's hard, it's hard to describe the casting process, but a lot of the time, you, know, you listen and you listen and you listen. You have interesting actors doing interesting things, and then boom, Lenore walks in. And that's everybody says, that's it, that's it. And we're there. And thank God she finally got talked into walking <laughs> in because I guess you know, the first 30 didn't work. So. And as actors, we kind of wish we could do that every time. <laughs> Where you just walk in and you open your mouth and go, yeah, that's it. That's what we're looking for. I mean, yeah, it doesn't quite happen that way. Usually you, you get a lot of rejection and then you hit one that's, that works. And, well, and it's great when it does. And again, let's want to give you guys a kind of shout out that, look, I'm not going to argue with Hugh Jackman, okay? Man is Hugh Jackman, and he's Wolverine in the live action films. But anytime I see an image of the X Men, it's your voices I hear in my head. Uh, and that's just, it's been that way for 30 years, and we'll continue that way. You're the voices in my head. So thank you for that. Thank you. I can attest to the several hundred issues that I've read, I read them all. So, and as a fun aside, I lost count, but I know you said Beetlejuice at least three times. <laughs> so Oops. keep an eye out in the car. It's showtime. Trying not to burst into laughter because every now and then I look back, we've got Jason. Jason. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> so we'll have Freddy versus Jason versus Beetlejuice yeah. in the next panel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three dead guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, is there any uh, story arc from comics that did not make it to the show that you really wanted? And if there's a reason why it didn't happen? It's a great question. Yeah. Actually, uh, <coughs> to give you a sense of it, the first season, we were just so desperate to get. 13 stories approved, and because we started you know, about a month behind, we ended up uh, have, kind of delaying the premiere because of usually new shows have production problems, and we certainly had them in spades. Um, so that first season, 
uh, there were certain people in the creative group, like the artists, that knew the X-Men backwards and forwards. Probably read every single episode, uh, every uh, issue for 25 years that they were out there. Uh, I and my two main writers, on the other hand, barely knew who they were. So the last thing we, I mean, we had some writers who knew them, but the main uh, three guys that were, were laying out the stories, X-Men were new to us. So the last thing in the world we had was like an agenda of, oh, I need to get the Phoenix Saga in there. I need to get uh, issues, this issue where this bad guy comes in because that was my favorite and I really want to see it on scene. There were writers that would pitch us stories that way. And I'm sure some of them could give you a long list of stuff that they really wanted to get on from the books. But that just, you know, by the time we'd done the first season, I'd read a bunch of books. And we ended up um, in season three getting, getting to do the, the Phoenix Saga books and we realized what a big thing they could be. Um, but I, the way we looked at picking the stories was we looked at, okay, what, who is Rogue? What's her character? Let's do a, a two-part episode that really showcases her as deeply as we can in the, the, the story The Cure. Now, we always used people from the books, but we were much more interested in that story being as intense a Rogue story as it could be, even if we didn't use one word from the books. If we could use stuff, great, because the fans would like it, and use characters, why you make up new bad guys when there are 800 bad guys <laughs> to pick from in the, in the X-Men universe. But our, by chance, our perspective was, let's think of the characters first and build stories around them. And in, in the case of one, like Days of Future Past, which, which Julian did, uh, there was a pre-existing book and okay, let's let's actually think of this a little as an adaptation. But even there, we had to change that around by about a third because we had a, we had a different cast group of characters than they did that Chris Claremont did back in the seventies. So we bits and pieces, and we used the books as reference material. But we almost always thought first of the original story, and then secondarily, what could we use from the books. I think we have time for one more question. This is actually from my client, Jason, as he came out to speak. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm the manager of the Fright Crew back there. All right. Woo! So if anything is, happens, I'm not liable. <laughs> But Jason would like to know, for any or all of you, who would you cast as Rogue and Jubilee in the MCU? In the movies? Ooh. Yeah, in the future movies. And, and, and I cast Lenore Zan in House of Thank you. Thanks for that bold question. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks for that vote of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like, I don't know, I like to go with less known. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of just like of casting celebrities and such these, I think the character needs to speak for themselves. You don't want to be seeing, oh, it's, you know, whoever, like, I don't know, I'm not a big celebrity person. So I've got, you know, there are lots of, um, Actors in Toronto, young um, teen girls. Uh, Ava Rowe, she's like, I think she's probably 14 years old. She was the voice, there's a show on um, NBC Universal called Power, but not Power Bird, it's Remy and Boo. And she was the lead voice of Remy, and she's fantastic. Uh, her singing and dancing girl group, G Force, was on America's Got Talent a few years ago when she was only like, or 13 or something like she's she's awesome so she's kind of who I I picture someone like that she's got sass she's got attitude she uh, she kind of put Simon Cowell in his place when she was 13 <laughs> like someone like that I'd love to see anyway, shout out to Ava wherever you are buddy <laughs> um, yeah not I'm not big on celebrities in these important 
what it calls it. It is going to be interesting to see where um, the Ms. Marvel movies go, you know, because we all know Carol Danvers was, is eventually subdued <laughs> by Rogue before Rogue joins the X-Men um, and is talked into killing or draining Ms. Marvel of all her life force. And then that's when Rogue gets her ability to fly, right? And puts her into a coma. So it's gonna be interesting to see if they take that 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 track or not. I, I have no idea, I haven't heard anything. But it should be interesting. And then how did you guys feel about the very first X Men movie and the fact that they stole Jubilee's storyline and gave it to the rogue? I know. <laughs> By the way, yeah. Oh, I mean, you didn't have to do that. They like did you didn't have it as yeah. Jubilee, but it yeah. was awesome on our own. Like, we we yeah. loved some of the stuff in the movies. Yeah. But I think one of the things that we found a little frustrating was they, for all the, like, the genius of casting Professor Xavier and, and Magneto and some of the other choices, Wolverine. Wolverine, they didn't, they somehow didn't seem to be able to know what to do with the women yeah. the way we had. I mean, we had four really strong distinct female characters that were, had lead scenes in almost every episode. And, I don't think, I mean, Halle Berry, I don't think they knew what to do with her. She's just kind of standing around in the background while the guys talk to each other. And then, you're right, you, you were looking, where, where's, where's Rogue, who needs to, you know, like, fight Apocalypse toe-to-toe? -to -toe. Well, no, now she's a scared, nervous little girl and has co-opted, yeah, exactly, Jubilee's entry into the X-Men. And I'm sure that was a, an immediate decision. They said, okay, uh, who's gonna be our, our young uh, person who's, who's the kind of eyes the get into the, this world of death. The, the demographics. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was a demographic decision. They were like, oh, well, we got to get some young character in there that's, that the teenagers are going to like, well, well, Rogue's cool, but, well, let's just make her like Jubilee. So they kind of morphed the two characters yeah. together, which did not do justice to either character. Yeah. And I was disappointed. That, yeah, that, that was the single biggest satisfaction I think yeah. we had was the deal with the women. Right the women. Yeah. Julia, I'd like to give you the, the last word. Oh, those are the last word? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's, here we are talking about it, talking about major films that made a lot of money. When, when all this began, X-Men animated series, there were 30 years of books up until you got to pick who you were going to have on your team. And then from there, you mentioned it, Allison. Superhero is, is now a genre of film, and it it yes. dominant genre. And it wasn't. There was no. It wasn't. There, there weren't that many films. If X Men, the animated series, hadn't sort of created or found an audience for things, then that wouldn't have led to the other iterations, and that wouldn't have led to Fox's decision to finally make the movie. Margaret Lesh went to Fox live action after X Men hit big and said, "This is a." This is a hot property. You need to make a movie, mm -hmm. and it took them how many years before they made a movie? And that was the woman who believed in the property the whole time. And in the making of that movie, we got the next X Men movie and the next, and from there came the interest to explore Iron Man and Thor and the Avengers. And none of that, I think, would have happened. I'm going to say this here without X Men: The Animated Series and, and the, the friends and family that it created and found to be the fan base that, that begat the, this movie empire. So. Yep. Amen, amen to that. <laughs> so, um, I, I hate to bring this to a close. I'm sure we could do this for at least another hour or five. <laughs> Capture America, I can do this all day. Um, uh, but fortunately, there's still more of the con. Uh, so panelists, please tell these fine folks where they can reach you here and then online. Start with Laura. Oh, okay, well, we're all in the corner. Some of you have come to visit us already. <laughs> But if you go straight into the hall where everything is happening, we're to the right at the end. Um, and we're all happy to meet you, sign autographs, do selfies, whatever you want. And uh, online, I'm just like, you just remember my name, Lenore Zan. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, if you follow me and write to me sometimes, you know, on, online, I, I oftentimes write back. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty conversational with my fans, so, yeah, thank you. 
One funny story. Okay, so I don't know if you recognize this shirt. Okay. This was a crew shirt we got at the end of season two. Oh so we had God. a wrap party at the end of season two, and we were at the Harbor Castle Weston Hotel, and um, Joe Calamari was there. That's and a great name, Joe Calamari, by the way. Joe Calamari. So he was, he was our guy from Marvel that basically oversaw the show and was at all the recordings. And his son was there, he had a teenage son. So at this party, I was like, I guess I was nine, eight, 18 or 19 by now. Um, and they basically, I was at the kids' table. <laughs> so I was there with Joe's son, who was probably like 14 or 15, and Barry Flatman, who was another voice actor, his son was there as well, and he was like 14. So the, the rest of the tables were full, so I was at the kids' table sitting, and I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> like, like, you know, whatever. But as a result, Joe's son had a crush on me, and so I got three of these guys. <laughs> <boys. laughs> TAS for X Men the Animated Series. We kind of came up with that just to distinguish it five years ago, six years ago when we started doing the stuff. So, X Men TAS, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and our and we have our email address here is X Men TAS92 at Gmail. We, I, we try to stay as active as we can. We try to interact as much as we can, uh, try to answer questions. We have a blog, uh, website, X Men TAS.com that if you have a, a, a question or something, you may be able to find the answer just looking through old posts there, because we try to be as conversational. And links, and links to podcasts. So please try and find us, you know, and thank you all so much for celebrating this with us. This is huge. Yeah, thank you. So once again, uh, thank you to Marcus and Steve and all the other fine folks putting on Planet FunCon to uh, afford us this opportunity. And thanks once again, last but not least, uh, these fine folks for joining us. So, great, great to be here.